few years in the church, somebody invited me to help in the deaconry, to collect the money, to announce the opening song, to say uh, the, the prayer, hallelujah. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Oh, the sermons were wonderful. Coming to church was always a pleasure for me. And I have been a church member for now 30 years. Hallelujah. Go, therefore, and make disciples. And not to forget the health reform. I haven't touched any alcohol and any cigarettes and even changed my diet. I became a vegetarian, even a vegan. Hallelujah. Go, therefore, and make disciples. I went to Adventist school, Adventist university. I graduated from an Adventist institution. And there I found even my sweetheart. Hallelujah. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Oh, Lord, now I'm getting older. Uh, I'm facing retirement, but I'm still going to church every Sabbath. Oh, they are so wonderful, the sermons I hear. And I even teach in Sabbath school. Hallelujah. Go, therefore, and make disciples. My life has been expanded through this health reform. I want seven more years. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Now I am on my deathbed. Oh, Lord, I made all the preparations necessary. I wrote my last will. I even uh, uh, have some money for the church. And an Adventist minister will hold the funeral service. Hallelujah. Go to your grave. This is sometimes we behave. And I hope uh, I got you on the nerve with this story. But imagine, God has to listen to us year by year, sometimes even decades. We rehearse the same story. We practice the same story in our own life. We know the Great Commission, but we sin doing the Great Omission. Not going, therefore, and not making disciples. Then comes Resurrection Day. Please open your Bible, Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And I want to bring God's word. I will not comment on it because it should impress our hearts. What God will say when he will come uh, in his glory and all the holy angels with him. I'm reading Matthew chapter 25 and I'm starting from verse 32. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. I jump to verse 40. And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. 
naked, and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. This is the outcome. We, as Christians, are sometimes so peaceful. Adventists are peaceful. They don't kill animals. They don't kill other people. Um, they are good neighbors. They are sometimes so peaceful, like a graveyard. They are too silent. They don't speak anymore. They don't speak anymore to anybody. It's why we have this great commission that God has given us. And I want us to ponder a little bit on the going and on the making disciples. I would like to have the first slide shown, please. <clears throat> we understand that it is a big challenge, the Savior's commission. And it says here, I'm quoting the spirit of prophecy in the book Desire of Ages. Uh, I hope you can read. It's not uh, in the largest uh, font. But it says here that all believers in Christ yeah, should be discipling. The great commission is to all believers in Christ. It, the question is, when does it start? When does it start? Whenever you start believing in Christ, we can start as children to believe in Christ. And when we believe in Him, we have a great commission. Whatever one's calling in life, his first interest should be to win souls. This is the the only reason of existence of our church. It should be our first business in life. Our first interest. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge as a student. As a student, you don't have money, you don't have time. That's a good excuse. But not before the Lord. When you are on a job somewhere, you don't have much more time than as a student. You may have some more money. And it's a challenge again to make it your first interest. When you get retired, you think you may have much time, you may have some money, but maybe the lack of health will take you the time you want to have. It's a challenge. So be aware that every stage of life remains a challenge. And the sooner you take the decision to make it first interest, your first interest, your first business, to win souls for the Lord, the better it is for you. Life doesn't get easier. I'm older than most of you. I'm enjoying life, but I can assure you, life does not get easier. So don't wait to make it the first interest in your life. Next slide, please. Now, I irritated you a little bit with my introductory story. But think of Jesus and the thousands of years he had to observe humanity. He had to see how the Christians were doing. He is watching us year by year, neglecting uh, the business of winning souls. And it says here, heaven sent indignant at the neglect shown to the souls of men. How would a father and mother feel did they know that that child lost in the cold and the snow had been passed by and left to perish by those who might have saved it? Would they not be terribly, gravely, widely indignant? 
And there's a very stark term used here. The term of murderer. Would they not denounce those murderers with wrath? Hot as their tears, intense as their love. The sufferings of every man are the sufferings of God's child. So when we neglect somebody, when we fail to go and reach out, we are compared to murderers by the spirit of prophecy. This is strong wording. Because those people we are not reaching out to are also the children of God. We may, uh, and it's called also the wrath of the Lamb. We have to understand that. God is not pleased with this. And uh, you have to understand this. You are employed, you have a boss. The boss tells you to do something and you don't do it. What happens to you? What happens to you? You get a warning, uh, if, if, if it is a good boss, he wants you ahead. A, a second warning, maybe a third, and when he fires you. I'm a physician. Uh, in my job description, it says that I have to treat patients. Now suppose there is an, uh, uh, an acute case in the emergency room, and I have the order to treat. Yeah, go therefore. And I tell, oh, oh I, I, I just read some very interesting article on this topic. This is wonderful. And the guy in the emergency room waits. He waits. And I'm reading a second article on a medical topic. And the guy in the emergency room waits. He gets a uh, Weaker and weaker. Do you understand the scandal? I would be fired without much, much uh, grace time if I would behave like that. And we would not dare behaving like that on the job place. But we do. We do in church. We don't take care of the Great Commission. Please, the next slide. It's a challenge, when, because when we read the Great Commission, and you may uh, have your finger on Matthew 28, it says that we have to make disciples of all the nations, all the nations, of all the people, those unfriendly people who don't like foreigners, who segregate foreigners, who don't treat you well. It says, go, therefore, and make disciples. Can we understand the challenge? Of course, if your child, if your wife, if your husband would be in the emergency room and you were the physician on duty, what would you do? You would race. You would race to the emergency room to save your child, your wife, or your husband because you love them. And I think this is a big challenge we face. We don't love people. They are not our passion. Otherwise, we would behave differently. And this is why we need the power of love. We have to link ourselves in divine connection with Christ because He is love in person. This is all taken from the Desire of Ages, uh, the quotation. And it is very interesting to read the very life of the church depends upon her faithfulness in fulfilling the Lord's commission. And now listen carefully. To neglect this work is surely to invite spiritual feebleness and decay. So if you don't practice what uh, you have been given, you lose it. Yeah? Uh, and you, you, you become weak. There, there is no active labor for others. Love reigns and faith grows dim. It's why, as Laodicea, we have this big challenge of being lukewarm. 
because we are not fulfilling the Great Commission. Love, love grows cold and decays. And um, why God has given us a Great Commission, but if we look at the context, we can be reassured there's a remedy to it. We are not left alone. And if I read verse 18, verse 18 in Matthew 28, please read with me. It says, Then Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. That means, if you want to be placed under God's authority, if you agree to obey his command, he will pass on this authority to you. He will empower you. He will give us the love we need. We cannot produce it of, of ourselves. But we have to place ourselves under his authority. That means to obey, not to wait. And I want, please, to have the, last, the next slide. I will not uh, read all the text, but I want to show the remedy, what it means to rely on God's authority. And uh, we will read the text in that regard. And that's the goal for all of us. The goal, the challenge, the goal. And we can reach it. Uh, Yes, we can. I can repeat that again. Because all authority has been given to Christ. And like the matchless grace of the compassionate Savior, so his servants are to present the riches of the glory of the unspeakable gift, the wonderful love of Christ. And the last sentence really touched me. It says here, Christ is sitting for his portrait in every disciple. This is a wonderful text. So he takes his time to sit and wait that you can uh, uh, become like him, to have his portrait in his disciples. And how are we going to do that? We cannot produce it out of ourselves. We are not loving it's sometimes difficult to love uh, your family members, let alone love a stranger, a foreigner, a guy who does not like me. This is difficult, but we have to sit and watch, and Christ is waiting for us. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. We mentioned that text already, but I want to read it for us, because this is the the only solution in order to be able to go and make disciples. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 18. And I'm reading, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. And what is the glory of the Lord? All the nice character traits which we had seen here. His much less love, his mercy. We need to develop that, to receive it from him. And when we behold him, it says here, we are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, from one level to another level, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's the Lord giving us the love we need. And... Uh, we can be reassured. Go, therefore, and make disciples. It's not a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. It is not an uh, invitation. It is a command. You have this imperative also in the Greek. We have no choice. This is the only way to fulfill our mission as uh, Christ's children. And uh, we will look now at the second uh, part of uh, what I want to focus on today. 
the making of disciples. Now, what are disciples? Please, the next slide. What is a disciple in the eyes of God? And this is a good definition I found in the book, Discipleship Essentials, uh, a practical definition. Discipling is an intentional relationship. It's not a random relationship. It's a purpose-driven relationship in which we walk not alone. When Jesus was on the mountain, he had already determined the time and the setting where he would meet his disciples after his resurrection. He had determined that already before he died. And there were not only 11 on that mountain. The spirit of prophecy tells us that there were around 500. So all who followed already Jesus when he was on earth, they came together in little groups. They didn't want to raise the suspicion of the uh, 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 jealous Jews because Jesus was resurrected. So they came together, they flocked to this mountain. And we have to have this picture. There are not only 11, there are around 500, all who were able to come. So he gave this not to a single person, but to many, to walk alongside other disciples. We should not go alone in order to encourage, equip, and challenge one another. How? How to challenge, equip, and nourish one another? And in love. Again, we have here the only energy who makes us going. To grow toward maturity in Christ. This is what we just read in 2 Corinthians. To be transformed into his likeness from one glory to another, to become more mature. Uh, not to just uh, improve the statistics of the church with some statist, uh, statistic persons, but to equip the disciples to make disciples who would also make disciples. This is very important. And now let's see how Jesus went about choosing his disciples. It's not a matter of quantity. Jesus could have created a political party with all the uh, uh, miracles he performed. He had huge masses following him. He could feed them. He could heal them from all diseases. Imagine him creating a party. Thousands and thousands would have followed him. Jesus, he chose only 12 people, 12 persons. And let's open our Bible. <sighs> I want uh, uh, you to read with me. And he, he chose them publicly. Matthew, no, let's look. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 to 16. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 to 16. So we read together. <clears throat> And it's interesting. I will read the passage and then just give some uh, comment on some details. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to him. And from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. Isn't that an interesting uh, procedure. First, what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? He made it a prayer priority. It was so important to him that he spent a whole night, it says here, he continued all night in prayer. It was a priority for him. His first interest, can we say, his first business, how careful he was. There were obviously more than 11 disciples or 12 disciples at that time. Because when night was over, he called his disciples. 
and he made a public, he made a public choice. What a risk. What a risk. He may have offended other disciples who thought they would be uh, selected or chosen. He made it public. When it was day, he called his disciples to him, and from them he chose 12. Interesting. He wanted a small number with whom he could work, on whom they, he could concentrate. It's friendship discipling. He didn't want a random uh, relationship. He wanted an intense relationship with these 12 people. And when you look at the list, I don't read the whole list, but they are mentioned two by two, interestingly. They are not mentioned alone. Discipling is always a team activity. It's a team of people, of people with Jesus. Nobody is never alone. The master is always present. The disciples are not alone. They have always another disciple with them. This is a, a good news. And what I liked, he didn't uh, uh, wait for years before he called them apostles. It says here, he also named uh, uh, them apostles. He named apostles. What is an apostle? Uh, the word itself says, means one sent forth. One sent forth. That it means one person who goes, who moves. It's an ambassador. A person who bears a message. A person who represents the one who sent him. So Jesus installed, right from the beginning, his disciples as apostles, as ambassadors. He does not wait. He took all his time to pray. But when the decision came, it went just like that. Um, he named the disciples and called them apostles. Um, in the definition of an apostle, we can look at the lives of these apostles. They are eyewitnesses of the Lord. They experienced Jesus firsthand. They saw his resurrection firsthand. They were invested with power. And this is the good thing with Jesus. Jesus does not withhold power for himself. He gives it to the disciples. So when we go and make disciples, we should be generous. We should be loving and generous, empowering the people we bring the message to. This is an, uh, an important message. Now, let's open our Bibles again to uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 6. We stay in the same and look at Luke chapter 9, verse 1 and 6. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, Take nothing for the journey, neither stuff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So they, they had the, uh, the command, the order to go everywhere, not to leave out any house. I remember when I was a book evangelist, our instructors really told us, you don't leave out any house, even there is a, a warning of a, a dog. You know, sometimes on the fence you read those big red uh, plates, a uh, warning, Achtung, bissiger Hund. Yeah? No way, we had to go. And we did, and we survived. 
But the disciples were not left alone. What happened after they got the message, the command? Let's read verse 10. Jesus never leaves us alone. It says, And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. And he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. Isn't that wonderful? God gives us power. Um, he transforms us first with, through his love. Gives us the power we need. And then he wants to have feedback. He wants to give us feedback. He waits for us to return. He, took, he takes time for us and take us privately aside. Isn't that wonderful? I tell you, the more you get involved in, in this business of discipling people, the closer you come to Jesus because he will give you feedback. He will talk to you. And you will be inspired by him to do even more. It's why I like this text. We should not be afraid. And as we learned in Sabbath school, Psalm 139 is one of my favorite psalms. And it was also mentioned. God, when he tells us to go, he went already ahead of us. He's everywhere. So wherever he sends you and me, he is already there you want, uh, he wants us to be. He waits for you. You are never, never alone. If you think so, read Psalm 139. I may come to my conclusion. These are just a few thoughts I give you. Of course, we can expand more and more on that topic. And I call it the power of the broken box. This is what we need. You know, we have black boxes in, 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 in planes. They only help after an accident has happened. Yeah? It may be helpful for those uh, who take the planes uh, who are still alive. But the power of the broken box is something very special. And you find that story in Matthew 26, verse 6 through 13. Let's open, please. Matthew 26, verse 6 through 13. And this has touched me because the spirit of prophecy has a special comment on it. So when you are there, we will read uh, this story. It's a well-known story but we should translate it into our own personal daily life. And I'm reading. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head, and he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Maria Magdalene was a sinner and she experienced God's love in her life. We are all sinners and we need to experience God's love in our life. And if God has not touched us, how can we touch other people? If God has not broken our heart, so to say, how can we... Uh, have our love pour out to other people, broken our, our, our stone heart. And there's a, a good comment uh, by the Spirit of Prophecy, and I'm, 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 I'm reading it. <clears throat> As the alabaster box was broken and filled the whole house with its fragrance. So we can read that in John chapter 12. 
that the whole house was filled suddenly with the fragrance. So Christ was to die. His body was to be broken. But he was to rise from the tomb and the fragrance uh, of his life was to fill the earth. Christ has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet swelling aroma. And it says then, and walk in love as Christ has also has loved us. Walk in love as Christ has done. Uh, Mary was touched. And uh, the spirit of prophecy says also in uh, the book Desire of Ages, looking into the future, the Savior spoke with certainty concerning his gospel. It was to preach throughout the world. And as far as the gospel extended, Mary's gift would shed its fragrance and hearts would be blessed for her unstudied act. Kingdoms would rise and fail. The names of monarchs and conquerors would be forgotten. But this woman's deed would be immortalized upon the pages of sacred history. Until time should be no more, that broken alabaster box would tell the story of what? The story of the abundant love of God for a fallen race. So if God's love has not impressed our heart, has not broken our stony heart, we will not experience his love. We will not have this love. And my uh, plea today is that we may pray, pray with all intensity to receive this love of God, that we may take time to contemplate him. Only this will move us to go and make disciples, to love people into his kingdom. It goes only through love. And I want to show you an interesting statistic. Please, the last slide. If you would project the last slide. I'm sorry for the, uh, you may not see well. Can you read in the last row, can you read uh, the, the numbers? Yeah? I want to show you a difference um, between an evangelist and a discipler. You know, an evangelist, he comes, holds his conferences, his series, baptizes, and then leaves. And you don't know what happened to those who were baptized. A discipler makes disciples who are discipling other people. So let's take a dream evangelist, a star evangelist, who wins in one year 365 people to God, we are for God. And let's take a discipler who only wins one person, one person, but keeps discipling the following year. And since one person he brought to God is a disciple too, you have an exponential growth. Do you understand? You have... Uh, an exponential growth. On the, the evangelist only has an additional growth. He has every year 365, 365. The discipler, he doubles the number every year. And at the end, even after 13 years already, he has won more people, more disciples for the kingdom of God than the evangelist who started out much better. This is just a statistic. It does not mean uh, uh, real numbers, but it is important that we understand. Love moves people, and uh, we should pray for God's love, that we may move ourselves through his love, and that our love may move the people we need to reach. This is my prayer for us today. Amen.